So thank you very much. Can I invite uh, the next panel to come up? So that's Justin, Jude, Richard and Stian, please. So as the panel are coming down, what I'll do is just give you a little bit of introduction. So I'm Anne-Marie Corriott, I work for Wellcome. Um, I work in the science team, but I work across the organisation. I'm very much um, privileged and delighted to be here today as the Research on Research Institute launches. The Research Landscape team cares very much about the issues that have uh, just been introduced and discussed. We care very much about research culture, about careers, about the way in which we assure quality and trust in research. These are very much systemic issues and they are not things that we can solve alone. So delighted to be here. Turning ourselves um, as funders into the subject of research, also a very exciting uh, development. But as Sarah says, this is not new. This is an evolution. So this session um, very neatly follows on, obviously, from the first. We're going to explore priorities for research on research, from data to deliberation and decision making. Specifically, we're going to look at how research on research can or should support discussions on prioritization and allocation of funding by governments and funders alike. We have, as all the sessions have today, a stellar cast in front of us. Um, the very first discussion uh, will be led by Vijay Raghavan, the principal science advisor from the government of India. And in two seconds, I'll give a thumbs up to the team at the back because he's going to be beamed to us remotely. Um, we'll then be followed by snapshots from Justin Parkhurst, who's associate, uh, sorry, assistant professor at Global Health Policy at the London School of Economics. We then have Jude Franzman, uh, co-convener of Rethinking Research Collaborative, and followed by Richard Jones, um, who's professor of physics at the University of Sheffield and co-author on Biomedical Bubble. And then we're delighted that we've got uh, Stian Westlake as discussant, who will bring some reflections on the talks that we've just heard. And Stian is from the National Endowment for Science, Technology and Arts. So without further ado then, if I can ask the team at the back to beam us VJ, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me with you this morning, albeit by video. I would have much preferred to be there personally with you and sharing a cup of coffee at the Welcome Collection in the morning. Nothing as stimulating as that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, unfortunately, since I have to leave and go to Japan shortly, uh, this is uh, one way of interacting. Uh, and I hope to receive uh, from Andy and others feedback on how this exciting, uh, what I'm sure will be an exciting meeting will go. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the Welcome Trust for having this uh, discussion on frontiers on research on research. Um, why is research on research important? Uh, you would have already discussed that in the previous panel, but I'll give you an Indian perspective. Very briefly, uh, Indian science, as in many other countries, had its early successes by the genius of individuals. And these individuals rose randomly from our ecosystem. The ecosystem didn't search them out and they did wonderful science. And people in India, such as Jagdish Chandra Bose, C.V. Raman, Meghnath Saha are examples. Homi Bhava later on, Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar. Typically, these men, and they were usually men all over the world, they then, some of them, took leadership in the institutionalization of research. This started prior to the World War, to the Second World War, and went on substantially at much higher scale after the Second World War all over the world, particularly in India. And indeed, India is one of the few post-colonial countries which invested in research rather substantially. And this is very unusual. And the consequences of those investments have been enormous in making India a significant player in science. There are many quality Indian scientists. A lot of quality basic work is done in India, but also taking science into application in medicine, in agriculture, in space, in energy, in atomic energy, and so on. So the investment in the institutionalization of science has undoubtedly been valuable, even though it has been quantified very poorly. There are obvious benefits which have come, but we don't know whether we invested in the right way, by accident or by design, 
whether we invested more than we should have or less than we should have, and whether we were fortunate in getting uh, successes of certain kinds and whether those kinds of successes can be amplified in the future uh, by similar kinds of investment or do we, new, do we need new kinds of investment. So therefore, to understand all of this, we do need, given the institutionalization of science worldwide, a much better approach to analyzing data and making decisions. So how do we go from data to deliberation and decision making, which is the theme of this session? Now, in India, this process since 1947, since independence, a little after that, P.C. Mahalanobis, a fellow of the Royal Society and one of the world's leading data scientists, started the Indian Statistical Institute and India's Planning Commission and India's National Data Collection and Survey Organization. And this was an example for the rest of the world that data collection in the pre-internet days was extraordinarily detailed and it took several years to complete and each time it was completed that data was analyzed, distilled and used for decision making and so on. It was a bit cumbersome as the economy grew and as the economy grew the efficiency of that machine also was challenged because the rate of change in the economy was faster than the rate of data collection. So fundamentally earlier structures even though reasonably well established for the entire economy were and are stretched. Our science data collection also was similarly stretched. It used to collect data by looking at how much research spend took place from the government, from the private industry, from the public sector companies which invested in research and so on. And that collection process also took typically uh, a significantly longer time than the changes in funding required or the changes in science and technology in the world required. So again, from data to decision, one was also out of sync and continues, and we continue to be out of sync. So our decision-making systems very clearly require not only a rapid collection of data, but also an ability to make decisions from the data on a year-to-year -year basis rather than on a 5, 10, 15-year basis and make those decisions early on and keep that static over that long period. So we need to be able to be nimble and change our decision making according to the outcomes and impacts of our investment and that becomes a really major challenge. The problem with looking at research support from the perspective of how much we put in is that accounting systems of governments all over the world ask whether you have done what you set out to do. This bookkeeping exercise is maybe very valuable if you're going to build a big bridge or a highway, but this clearly cannot be the way by which outcomes and impacts of science are judged. If you tell a government department to account for the funds they have received, they will always point out that the funds have been spent well and point out outputs which show that. But what science is, and we all know that, is our outcomes and impacts vary. Sometimes small investments result in huge returns and some science, sometimes huge returns give returns very different from what the initial goals were set out to be. And there are many projects all over the world which attest to that. The Human Genome Project is an example. So in that situation, how do we use data, distill it and use it for decision making when you need at, at, uh, at the same time, simultaneously, you need public accountability for the value of the funds which have come. This requires communication to government, to finance ministries the world over, that the way science should be assessed needs to be different from the way the construction of a highway needs to be assessed. And that's something which we are embarking on in a big way and our, um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Mahapatra, who's there, will elaborate on how that is being done and how that's being done uh, amazingly and fortunately um, quite successfully over the last few uh, months and years. So we're going to have a better uh, decision-making system uh, as well as a better data collection system. 
Now, I'd like to add one important point to this, and that is data is, of course, invaluable, and our ability to collect large amounts of data, store them, is absolutely phenomenal. But we must remember that the capacity to freeze data is different from the capacity to thaw data. And unless we thaw data which is stored and use them wisely, the capacity to freeze data is of no use. So data must be made accessible. The second scope for error in the use of data is quite often we conflate correlation with causation. And unless one is expert in the area which we're looking at, whether investment is valuable or not, in addition to having all the data, there is a great danger that data alone can give misleading conclusions. For example, if you look at percentage GDP investment and correlate that to economic growth and value to the GDP, you will get a very strong correlation. But we must remember that's a correlation. Countries which have invested in science have not just thrown the money at science, but have also invested in time and effort in ensuring that that money is well spent. That requires deep domain expertise, not only in science, technology, but also in finance, economics, and the understanding of returns of investment. And therefore, science and technology and its interpretations in terms of potential outcomes and impacts is a specialized domain which we need to get into. So as, for example, as a physicist, uh, you might not be able to make the argument at an individual level, at an institutional level, or at the level of a country about the value of investment in condensed matter physics. But there should be a group of specialists who are able to analyze that and say whether that investment is valuable or not. Currently, our ability to attract funds successfully as scientists depends much on our ability to lobby in a manner which is quite often subjective and whose outcomes themselves uh, are unpredictable. <clears throat> so in other words, we need to make sure that data is used properly and that requires some specialized work because we have institutionalized science so much that scientists also get into the analysis of data in each uh, vertical, physics, mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, biology, and so on, to see how that analysis can help decision making and support funding organizations in that manner. Therefore, funding organizations need to have departments where the analysis of data is separated from decision making and its use, but experts should analyze the data and prepare tools so that everyone from the program officer upwards to the head of the funding organization can use that distilled data and those tools to see what is meaningful or what is not. <laughs> now, how does one provide incentives then for the next generation research, which will come as suggested outcomes of this analysis of data? Now, this is a big challenge because the current incentives for a variety of reasons have regressed to the lowest common denominator where individuals and their drive is what determines research directions quite often uh, or top-down government intentions sometimes disconnected with what is possible. Both these are dangerous dominating decision-making because of individual efforts or collectives of individuals had a noble intent where it is bottom up and let a thousand flowers bloom and as a consequence we will fund the best. But that as, this, as science and science institutions have become bigger has led to a situation where those who are capable of getting together and lobbying best oftentimes get the best awards. They're good but they also become a restraining force against diversity, the very purpose of encouraging individual uh, driven program. So individual driven programs are important, but they shouldn't be the sole driving force. How does one deal with that? To deal with that, one should also bring in institutions into the decision making process. In some places, not all, but in many, many places, uh, actually, uh, you have a situation where institutions and their leadership have been brought to a level where they are post people who take proposals from within the institutions and convey them to funding agencies 
and manage the funds received, taking overheads so that they can sustain themselves. Institutional decision making must be a little more than that, actually substantially more than that, and must involve department heads, deans and vice chancellors doing two things. One, protecting people in their departments and their institutions who, even though they're unable to raise resources, are seen to be extraordinarily valuable. So that's one important role they can play. And these investments in protecting these people will pay off in the long run. The second aspect they can do is to push and incentivize collective interactions within institutions and between institutions, between countries, so that frontier, small science, big science, intermediate science as collectives can be taken forward. For both these things to happen, the metrics of reward within institutions should move from those of rewarding individuals to rewarding departments and larger institutional structures, protecting diversity of uh, talent uh, as well as people in the institution. By that I mean there are going to be many people whose value to the department, to the institution, to the country is extraordinary and huge right now. There are others whose specialization and talents are unpredictable in terms of today's context, maybe even low in terms of today's context, but are obviously seen as being valuable as technology changes. But there's a third category who we oftentimes see as irrelevant to today's research, irrelevant to the research we foresee. And these are the eccentrics who are our insurance against the unknown unknowns. Those must also be supported. Those will not be captured by our metrics of uh, our assessment of data on research, on research. How do we decide how to support them and whether to support them? That must be something which the institutional mechanism puts off a certain amount of resources and protects people who are our insurance against future um, unpredictable changes in the landscape in terms of opportunities as well as problems. Britain is actually extraordinary in having a result of outcomes and impacts much more than what is invested because of its tolerance and support of such eccentrics. Other countries need to learn a lot from that, uh, from you, and make sure that we have such programs in our countries. It's always a big challenge because as science gets institutionalized, eccentrics get marginalized and we must try and do the opposite. Now finally um, let me come to um, how these metrics can result in an increasing set of um, attitudes towards culture and diversity. The fundamental problem we have today is because our science is so individual driven and because it has been made so competitive at that level, the metrics which government and funding agencies have set end up being gamed constantly. And this results in the effect of those who are successful becoming more successful and those who are not becoming less so. And the academic children of those who are successful having the right lineage and becoming more successful. This not only perpetuates a certain dynastic, non-democratic approach to science, but importantly, on the other side, it perpetuates a certain sluggishness to innovation in science. Yet, excellence is what must be promoted and not diversification or distribution of resources for its own sake without paying attention to quality. Both these are eminently feasible, but they're feasible only if attention is paid proactively by funding agencies. So in other words, the outcome of the research on research should be supporting programs which allow a diversity of viewpoints, a diversity of culture, gender inputs, and so on coming into both research on research and onto um, the uh, uh, science programs themselves. So therefore, if we are to use the data on research effectively, our review mechanisms must reflect that. And this is the elephant in the room. The resistance to change for that comes from the huge rump of successful, quote unquote, successful researchers, amongst whom are also those 
were extraordinarily bright and have contributed hugely. But there's a significant rump who, in addition uh, to being successful and having contributed, are also the ballast against change. So how does one change metrics in a manner which are fair to teamwork, are fair to adventurous projects, are fair to individuals and institutions, and yet don't compromise on excellence? Therefore, if, if we are to do this properly, while we change the metrics and so on, our data collection and analysis must be far more dynamic. It must be near real time and it must combine the real time collection of data with expertise in different areas. So you see the consequences, for example, of our investment in mathematics and you ask a mathematician to analyze the data or a group of mathematicians to analyze the data in the context of our other goals on diversity and uh, being at the cutting edge. So this is feasible, but has the value, has the requirement that we might need to create structures which analyze research on research more professionally in different institutions. The danger is that this results in another layer of bureaucracy, which has a life and a sustenance of its own. People accuse somewhat substantially correctly of our institutions becoming administratively heavy? Is this going to be another administrative heavy structure? And is this going to be policing how researchers work? And is this also going to be something which is gained? These are always challenges. There, is, there are always risks. But we must remember the safest airplane is one which doesn't take off. And a good airplane design will always have some risks. Research on research is an aircraft which now must take off. We must balance the risks and the rewards even for that subject and ensure that our investment in science and technology, the humanities and social sciences research, which must in, uh, increase, includes diversity on scale, but also results in effectiveness of the spends in a manner which promotes innovation and daring. Thank you very much. So again, if you could save questions to the end, we should have some time. But if I can ask Justin to give us eight minutes of an overview, you're very welcome to stand up or to sit down. I think I'm it should be up and running. Right. OK, great. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I'll try and be as quick as I can. I'm going to, my name is Justin Parkhurst. I'm an associate professor of global health policy at the LSE in the Department of Health Policy, which is a fairly new department. It's recently spun off from the Department of Social Policy, a much longer established department at the LSE. And I'm going to talk very briefly about a Welcome Trust supported project that I'm co-principal investigator on uh, that's really trying to understand how do we build capacity for health sciences research, uh, specifically in the African continent. Just note this is an international collaboration. Uh, as I mentioned, it's funded by the Wellcome Trust. We also work uh, closely with the African Academy of Sciences. We've got Tom Karaoke here today, who I think is giving some of the closing remarks, um, and, and colleagues of mine at the LSE. We also have a team of field workers who are based in Africa as well, who are doing uh, some of the data collection. In, uh, they're based in Cameroon, Kenya, and Uganda. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because I don't think you really want to hear research presentations too much. So I'll really go th quickly through what we're trying to do in this and maybe one or two reflections if I have a minute. So give me maybe a two-minute shout before I finish, if you can. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're, we're trying to appro uh, approach this question about how do you build capacity for research, specifically health research, uh, and we're looking at the African context. We have three phases of our work. The first one is kind of a mapping of data to try and get the landscape of who's doing what, who's being more successful, uh, and how might you try and evaluate that. Then we're doing a series of nine uh, qualitative case studies uh, from countries which are at different levels of development, different levels of research uh, in, across the continent, um, Francophone and Anglophone. And then our phase three is, is some engagement workshop with senior officials. These are bureaucrats who work in departments of health, ministries of health, or ministries of higher education uh, who are actively involved in managing and supporting and constructing the environment for research to be done. And it's an attempt to get them to learn from each other. It's just facilitating peer-to-peer -peer learning about supporting the research landscape. 
It's also to note that this is not the first attempt people have tried to make in terms of uh, mapping or understanding research capacity in Africa. This is a, uh, a team based, I think, at the World Health Organization that tried to come up with a African health research barometer. Uh, that was based on surveys, though. They, they interviewed people in different countries asking them things like, do you have a National Academy of Science? Do you have regulations in place and the like? Um, our attempt uh, in our phase one is more looking at published data and available um, uh, secondary data of things like publications. Uh, so, you know, publications of, from any author or first author, citation counts and the like. Um, so that's an output of research. We look at inputs to research like uh, G, um, gross domestic expenditure um, on, on R&D or GERD. Uh, and we also kind of sampled and looked at the largest funders of health research and tried to find out how much they're spending in each country in the continent. So those are inputs, and then we looked at process indicators as well. Uh, how much, uh, which countries have clinical trials, um, infrastructures for clinical trials, do they have intellectual property rights, regulatory capacities, research institutions, centers of excellence, and so on. And so you end up with data charts like this, and again, this, this is an ongoing process. We haven't finalized our outputs yet, but you see you know, all the countries of Africa here, you see their GDP, and you see in column kind of three over publications. And the publications vary enormously, you know, having any author, um, even if you control for you know, population as well. Similarly with clinical trials, so publications and clinical trials, you have quite robust data for every country because clinical trials get registered either with the CDC in the US or with the World Health Organization. So you have quite comprehensive data, but then you have other data which are much more piecemeal. You don't have very comprehensive data on number of PhDs per capita, or on even on research spending per capita, much less research spending on health. So there's a lot of extrapolation involved. We recognize, of course, that income matters as well. So you, can, you, you will obviously see trends uh, in terms of, so this is the relationship between GDP and publication outputs. Um, but it's beyond national income. So I just pulled out two uh, here to give a quick example. Uh, this is Tanzania and Lesotho, who both have very similar per capita GDP, but very different research outputs uh, in terms of just quantity per capita. So in terms of the percent of GDP invested in research, in Tanzania it's about 0.28%, uh, you know, while Lesotho is 0 0.08. Um, so that's you know, four to five times uh, difference, I guess, there. Um, four times, just under four. Uh, similarly, publications per million populations, 50 times higher in Tanzania, in terms of a Tanzanian author, uh, and that's per capita, despite similar GDP. So we know that there can be huge variation in countries across the continent in terms of their research, in terms of what they're doing, and the, and the outputs they're producing. Uh, I'll skip over this. We're doing a bit of conjoint analysis with um, asking people to choose between different ar arrangements of if a country has more clinical trials or fewer research staff or more research, you know, public PhDs, which one would you say is a stronger candidate? We've done this with our stakeholders working in countries to try and get some uh, idea of which of these categories matter more uh, to people, which are more important because obviously, you know, clinical trials is not the same as publications. How would you, how would you rank them between them? So that was the phase one work. Phase two work, which is ongoing, is about qualitative research where we've picked nine countries. I list them here. Uh, we've so far conducted 175 interviews. We're finalizing the coding today. It's supposed to be the end of the coding process and then the analysis coming up. Um, but we looked at key stakeholders in terms of researchers, regulator regulators or decision makers, and research funders as well. And it's about two thirds English, one third French. Obviously there's some themes emerging and this is not a research publication, you know, a research talk to, to go into detail of it. Um, but you know, all respondents are emphasizing the importance of funding, collaboration, networking, institutional human capacity and research use and uptake. Um, interestingly, we saw very little mention of the private sector. We, th we think we need to explore that in our data some more uh, because obviously the private sector can be a great generator of, of research, particularly in health, but it just doesn't seem to be coming out that much in the African context. Thank you. Um, and a number of key challenges. We also tried to pull out some success stories uh, to try and show you know, where have countries been able to do something uh, and embed more research. So I'll just mention very quickly too, Liberia really used a window of opportunity after the Ebola outbreak to establish new rules that local research required co-PIs and funding uh, for capacity building. Madagascar, another example where they basically, so that was a capacity building success story. Madagascar, more of a funding generation advocacy within government trying to link the research agenda to economic growth targets of the government. They wanted to join uh, this uh, Codex commission, but that required certain data to be presented and, reg and, and, and available. And so they tried to build in research uh, capacity and research use in order to convince the government that joining that group would require more research. So I think I have one minute left, and I think all I'll reflect on then is, is interestingly on what some of the previous speakers have said. 
it, it's easy to kind of just go to countries and say, you know, what worked, what didn't work. But for me, and I'm more of a political scientist, um, I think there's some interesting issues to learn about this idea of windows of opportunity in order to lobby and advocate. We think of research as a technical exercise, but really what's coming out is how much of this is a political process of advocacy. Uh, James mentioned it himself. He's advocating in, uh, in the UK. We see that in, in the African context as well. It's all about advocacy for more research funds and support. And so it's about how do those who are have the mandate for generating research, how do they seize on windows of opportunity to embed, and this is the second side of my political science hat, the institutions. How do you institutionalize evidence use? How do you build, so the, our, our Indian uh, speaker before talked about you know, building new data organization institutes. How do you establish national academies of science? How do you, um, how do you build structure systems, but also rules that, um, uh, that example of the success story, building a rule about capacity development, that's a form of institutionalization in my mind. So we're really looking for opportunities, and I think there's a lot more work to be done to think about the institutionalization of research systems and processes that will build capacity overall. And I think I'm out of time. Perfect. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. <laughs> so if I can invite Jude to come up and give her overview, that would be super. Thank you. That's good. Um, so th thanks very much uh, for inviting me to, to speak today. I'm going to talk on behalf of, behalf of a network called the Rethinking Research Collaborative, which is an international network of networks involving academics, civil society practitioners, research brokers, and funders who are all committed to working together to rethink research systems, but also um, the politics of transnational collaboration in the context of global challenges. And I've been asked to speak today about this um, idea of global challenge research, what it means for the type of research that Rory will be, will be focusing on. Um, so I just want to start by contextualizing this new agenda around global challenge research. I think there's agreement that new approaches, um, that, that uh, large-scale intractable challenges such as the climate crisis, health pandemics, and migration are demanding new approaches to research that are complex, so involving multiple countries, disciplines, and professional sectors, collaborative, so involving those most affected by challenges, and also best placed to address the challenges, as well as specific centers of, of expertise, and adaptive, so building on what the um, previous speaker, the pan panorama speaker developed, this idea that research is changing, that contexts are changing, issues are changing, and there is new learning available all the time. So research needs to be adaptive as well as collaborative. This raises several questions. For example, what then is the relationship between research excellence and evaluations of quality and research impact? Who sets these agendas for impact? What type of research capacity is needed? And both of the previous speakers mentioned this issue of capacity, not just um, what capacity is needed, but where should it be located and how can it be recognized and strengthened? And then what is the relationship between global challenges and global development? Is there a social justice agenda within this space? And if so, what does that, this mean for the need to rethink traditional globalized approaches to research? So this final question marks a shift in discourse from an agenda focused on effectiveness to one focused on equity. This has its roots in a normative approach to, to research based on the need for more democratic knowledge, cognitive justice or decolonized research, but also an instrumental need for more impactful, relevant research, which, um, as well as the contribution of, of multiple knowledges to new disciplinary knowledge, and also a statutory ad agenda. And in the UK in particular, the recent investment by the government in over of the Overseas Development assistance, assistance Budget into research is raising the question of ODA compliance. If this budget is to be used, there needs to be a rethinking of, of the um, existing research system so that the aid is not tied, but there is real impact and benefits to those in lower income countries. <clears throat> 
This equity agenda is also linked to an emerging ecological agenda as well, which raises questions as to the carbon footprint of research and issues around mobility of transnational collaboration. These agendas are not conflicted with a more ecological practice there are opportunities to decentralize research to ensure that capacity is recognized and strengthened in the global south, that uh, mobility is limited by expertise being centered in the south and more funds being allocated to the global south as well. However, the situation as we know is far from equitable. This is a map based on citation bibliometrics um, from Web of Science, the data I think comes from 2011, but it shows two, um, it makes two interesting points. First of all, that there is extremely unequitable uh, resource distribution around research, but secondly, that the way that research is represented through scientometrics shows a particular world distribution which ignores hidden research, either research that is not published in registered journals, research that is conducted outside of traditional academics in um, indigenous universities, for example, by think tanks, civil society organizations um, with um, policy, more, more policy and practice focus organizations. There is a lot of evidence to show that these are the types of research often being used to inform policy and practice over and above academic research. However, this isn't represented in, the, in these types of metrics. So this raises five opportunities for Rory in terms of rethinking um, both research systems and also the re representation of research systems based on new metrics. First of all, the need to inter interrogate the politics and the modalities of global, funding, of global challenge research funding. This might include research into the expenditure of overseas development assistance on um, academic research, but also transnational research funding and governance practices. Secondly, the need to map participation, where, which agendas are being set, by whom? Who is participating in the evaluation, the governance, the implementation of research? Where are they based, from which disciplines, from which, which countries, um, and what is needed to change? Thirdly, the need to expand the reach, inclusivity and diversity of science metrics to answered precisely the types of questions which have been addressed by the previous speaker. Fourthly, to look beyond the metrics, to use met methodologies, for example, um, ethnography or participatory methods to capture hidden outputs and practices, systems and, and agendas which might not be represented in traditional um, scientometrics. And finally, I think this also relates to what was said in the panorama, to think about global research futures, not just the world today, but the world that we are looking to develop in the context of climate constraints, carbon constraints, and other um, type of resource constraints. So how can we use future studies, anticipation studies, methods from um, forecasting and scenario mapping to creative methods to rethink these futures? And I just want to conclude by pointing at some of the research which already exists, which has been looking at these sort of issues. So the Rethinking Research Collaborative, along with the UNESCO Chair Platform in Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education, is looking at community-based research, practitioner-led research, and collaborative research based on setting agendas at the local level and scaling this up into global capacity networks. Organizations like the Global Development Network, my colleague Francesco Abino is, is here, and the African Academy of Sciences, I think the previous spe speaker referred to, um, Tom Karaoke, who's also here, are looking at rethinking research systems in the global south, recognizing the um, diverse but 
but huge sources of capacity already there and looking to strengthen them. And other organizations, for example, the International Development Research Center in Canada has developed new types of research quality evaluation mechanisms which recognize diversity, equity, and context in order to inform better agenda setting and evaluation of research in a more equitable way. Thank you. Um, just like to invite Richard Jones to give us our final snapshot. I'm Richard Jones. I'm a physicist from the University of Sheffield. And what I want to talk about today is really this idea of scientific uh, productivity. How do we define uh, scientific productivity? How do we measure it? And in particular, the question of whether, uh, uh, whether scientific productivity is, is falling. So if we look at the output of science by kind of really crude measures, what we find is that uh, it, it's exponentially increasing. And of course, the first thing you'll notice, that so this is a graph just of the number of articles published showing an exponential increase in those articles. Of course, the first thing you'll say to me is, I've written productivity. This isn't really a productivity. This is an output because we need some kind of input measure. And indeed, uh, uh, that, that's obviously true, and it's more complicated than it seems. Uh, but what I want to talk about really is if we say the productivity, we imply some kind of output. So how do we, uh, uh, how, how do we measure, how, how do we define uh, uh, the outcome of science, the outputs of science in, in, a, in a proper way? So we could be talking about a, a, a measure of new science as defined within the scientific community, something about the quantity, the quality, citation measures of impact, all that kind of thing that are familiar to, to, to many of us who study the scientific metric world. But I think many of us would really want to focus also on what science does outside the scientific community? How do we measure the effectiveness with which science ad uh, advances, scientific advances translate into those wider socioeconomic goals? And uh, we hear a discourse of grand challenges, mission-driven research. Uh, Jude spoke about global challenge research. In each this case, as these discourses become more important, I think the question of how do we tell whether those challenges are being met becomes more and more important. So I think there's actually a, a, a gathering sense that the productivity of the global scientific endeavor is actually declining or running into uh, a, a problem of diminishing returns. So very distinguished economists, uh, uh, Nicholas Boone, John Dandereen and, and people, uh, published a very uh, influential paper a couple of years ago called Our Ideas Getting Hard to Find. Uh, uh, Michael Collison and Patrick Nielsen published an article in Atlantic magazine uh, called uh, uh, Science is Getting Less Bang for Its Buck. Uh, and this connects to a kind of wider sense in, uh, of some economists that, um, um, that, 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 that the rate of innovation is slowing down. So I think you can question some of the methodologies in detail that underlie some of these, uh, the, 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 these papers, but I think that there really is something in it. And if we look at the rate of innovation in some of the kind of classic science-led industries, uh, we see that slowing down. So, for example, I think not widely recognized enough, given the importance of IT to the modern economy, the age of exponential growth in computer power is over. Uh, that we, we, we uh, got used to combination of Moore's law and Denard scaling, which meant year on year uh, constant uh, uh, percentage increases in, in computing power. In fact, that era ended in 2004, the era of rapid growth, and by now, uh, growth has almost come, come, come to a halt. Uh, likewise, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, it's a very well-known plot that Jack Scannell did a few years ago, uh, so-called E-Rooms Law, showing uh, the exponential decline in, uh, in R&D productivity in the pharmaceutical industry, if we measure that by the number of new drugs per billion dollars of, uh, of R&D. So uh, in, in specific science-driven industries, we see this rate of innovation apparently by some measures, and maybe these measures aren't good enough, but we see it declining. What about the impact on the, the wider economy? 
What we expect, you, you know, what we tell our finance ministries is that R&D uh, uh, leads to economic growth, it leads to increased productivity. But at the moment, the general economic background right across the developed world is of falling productivity or, or stagnating productivity, productivity not growing as fast as we've grown used to. So since 1970, UK labour productivity grew steadily at about 2.3% a year. And that abruptly ended at the global financial crisis. Maybe not a surprise it ended in the financial crisis. The surprise is it never recovered and it's been growing at only a, a, a fraction of a percent ever since. And of course, this directly impacts on uh, people's life experience. Um, uh, th th there's a very direct relationship between average wages and labour productivity, uh, and we see that same stagnation in, 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 uh, in average wages. So I think it's not a stretch to argue, if we take the wider uh, political environment, that uh, you know, we see very weird and sour political times across the developed world at the moment. And I think this sense of the break between, the break of the link between scientific advance, technological progress, and improved living standards is, is a really serious problem. And of course, it's not just about money. We expect science to, to, to help us lead longer and healthier lives. And again, we see, if we look at life expectancy, in the UK, we see that steady growth in life expectancy that we saw right up actually until a few years ago. It seems to have uh, it seems to have stalled. So I think there's a really strong case that if we talk about the productivity of science at this most macro level, and of course there are many other confounding factors, and you could easily argue that science has been advancing fine, but lots of other things have been going wrong. Uh, nonetheless, this, this, this break in the link between the rate of innovation in science-led industries, the wider um, uh, uh, slowing down of productivity, uh, it, this is a serious issue that I think we need to be concerned about. So how do the choices that, that, that people make affect this? I think this needs to be a central theme of research on research. We do make choices. Here are a couple of examples. Um, uh, uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so, there have been, uh, been big shifts in, uh, in the emphasis of science in the UK. So the share of UK government R&D expenditure by socio-economic goal, it shows this big shift from defence into health. Uh, we also see uh, 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 so some other things that are surprising this, a, a very, very low level of investment in energy. You know, we might believe the rhetoric of a climate emergency or not, but given the scale of the energy transition that comes, that's, uh, that's a surprising thing. So these choices are being made. It's an emergent system. Right, here, here's another example. We've, we've chosen to focus research in the UK geographically in, in, in London, Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, we've uh, Jude talked about uh, inequities of distribution of research nationally uh, uh, between nations. We don't consider this very much at the regional uh, level either. So I think the question of what science is for in these difficult times becomes more and more pressing. Uh, I don't think anyone... Uh, uh, Grand challenges and missions are very important. Nobody, I think, could disagree that these big global challenges are important. Uh, that they're not the only reason, but a big part of the reason why funding bodies and societies should support science. But we need to make sure the priorities we select and the choices that we make are the ones that lead effectively to the delivery of those missions. And to finish, uh, James already mentioned this piece of work that uh, he and I did last year uh, about uh, priority setting in health-related research. It asked the question, how good are we at setting those research priorities in that area? The answer was, uh, these are difficult questions and uh, th these are the choices that we have to make. So we need to make explicit what outcomes we expect from science. We need to explicit, make explicit those choices and depending on the dimensions of uh, scientific productivity, we'll do our best to improve it. Thanks very much. So thank you very much all for your uh, very exciting and thought-provoking snapshots. I'd like to invite Stian now to give us a sort of five, six minute overview of observations and then we'll go into discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for those really fascinating presentations, which I think gave 
a really important range of perspectives on this question of how we make decisions about the research that we do and the impact it has. Um, I've got two interests in this. Um, I used to be a publisher of some of this stuff in the days when I ran the think tank at Nestor and we did a bunch of data analysis on innovation specifically, led by the fantastic Juan Mateos Garcia, who I know has been a partner of many of the people involved in this initiative. Um, but then more recently, uh, I served as the advisor to three UK science and innovation ministers, so I was a consumer of this information, or should I say, a would-be consumer. And perhaps if I can tell a quick story about that, that will illuminate the need here. Um, in the days when I was working with Joe Johnson and Sam Gima and briefly Chris Skidmore as the UK's ministers for science and innovation, um, we were, as a matter of government policy, very focused on challenge-led innovation. We put in place the grand challenges. And I would argue, despite many things going on in politics, it was quite a good time. There was quite a fair wind for good research policy to the extent that there was more money made available for challenge-led innovation through things like the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. There were, and you know, I know people are skeptical of politicians, but relatively speaking, we had competent, willing ministers, ministers who believed in R&D. We had a Secretary of State who had a PhD in economics, which is not something that we can always say, and people who genuinely believed that they could make a difference and wanted to do technocratically the right thing. And to some extent, we had political consensus. The Labour Party was also brought into this kind of thing. Um, but what I found, I found myself sitting in many ministerial meetings where we were making decisions on big research and innovation funding decisions with fantastic material prepared by very talented, intelligent government officials, some of whom are probably in this room or watching. Um, but we were just left thinking, what do we do with this? How do we make funding decisions, allocation decisions, based on what seemed like a very unstructured, sometimes inconsistent, sometimes quantitative, sometimes qualitative set of data. And I think this really comes back to the rallying cry that we first heard from Professor Vijay Raghavan about the need for creating digital tools that decision makers, whether they're politicians or whether they're technocrats, can use to make these decisions. And I feel I've been there, we didn't have the tools, and more importantly, we didn't have the practice. I think this isn't a question of building the tools in isolation, chucking them over the wall to politicians and saying, right, fine, good policy will now result. One of the great opportunities I see for Rory here is to develop, to iterate, to work with decision makers, whether that's in funding councils around the world or politicians, and with data sources, to come up with sources of information that really work. And I think that was something that really came across from the perspectives that we heard, particularly from India and from, from Richard Jones. Um, I think the second issue that I heard in a number of those presentations was what you might call the seeing like a state problem, to pick up on James Scott's formulation. The challenge of if you create fantastic data sets, on the one hand, it's great, it's great to make decisions in an informed way, but how do you make sure that the information that you have doesn't effectively pervert the decisions? How do you make sure that you're not um, biased towards the kind of thing that is measurable? And I felt one of the things that was particularly impressive about Professor Parkhurst's project was the mixed methods, the combination of qualitative, quantitative research, the use of judgment, and the attempt to understand the system, rather than simply take a bunch of metrics and make decisions on the basis of those, of, of, of those metrics. I think we heard um, from Dr. Fransman the importance not just of data, but of taking a broad approach, grounded in social sciences, grounded in humanities practice as well. And I think all those things help avoid this problem of looking for our keys under the lamppost because that's where the light is, as it were. Um, I think this is clearly a big issue for the initiative to look at. How do we, on the one hand, improve metrics but not create a situation where the kind of gaming that we know already exists in the system exists twice over? Um, one of the big themes that I think came from Professor Jones's presentation was the importance of making smart decisions about allocation and focus. Um, grand challenges, mission-oriented innovation are popular not just in the UK, but in, uh, in many parts of the world in a way that perhaps they weren't so much 20 years ago. Um, but it strikes me that we really don't yet know, 
how we should deploy, or what that means for the deployment of research resources. Um, should we be, one interpretation of mission-oriented innovation is saying, well, this means we should focus. Um, an alternative view says, well, we should try and create a balanced portfolio of research. Um, and it strikes me that there's some really interesting case studies on mission-oriented innovation. The kind of data that Rory will be producing and analyzing will allow us to form a more nuanced picture of where we are placing our bets, as it were. But it also creates an opportunity to say, well, what even should we be doing? What should we be placing bets? Should we be focusing? Should we be coming up with, with, with a balanced portfolio? And um, for those of you who are Twitter aficionados, the conversation that Professor Jones had with uh, Professor Paul Nightingale at the ESRC about fusion recently, where the UK government's recently committed to a, a big investment in next generation fusion, I think was particularly enlightening. So for, for I highly recommend that for further reading. And then the final element that I think was so important from the decision, particularly highlighted by Dr. Fransman and Professor Parkhurst, was this question of who decides. Um, and that's, this seems to be multifaceted. The kind of data that we've all been talking about here is really valuable, but it does create the risk of technocratic supremacy. And I think the importance of hearing voices, whether it's voices from the global south, whether in a country like England, it's about voices from the north of England or places that are neglected, those are both really important. It also raises the question for how do we bring together data for decision making with the kind of science and democracy or research and democracy agenda that I know people like James and others have, 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 have been thinking about very deeply. So a set of really interesting perspectives, a bunch of, in my opinion, really interesting research challenges for Rory, but I think this just confirms what an important task Rory is setting out on and um, I, I wish everyone the best in making it happen. So I think that set us up very nicely for discussions from the audience. We've got just over 15 minutes before your coffee break. Um, same routine, either pop down to the mic or if you can't, put your hand up and we'll get a roving mic to you. Excellent, I think we have our first question on its way. Laurie Hack from ORCID. Um, one of the things I think the last your comments, Deanne, really reminded me of the mission oriented decision making, don't make, is this, it almost sounds like you're asking for some kind of governance structure over this, right? And I think about that a lot when we talk about building open research infrastructure as well as some kind of governance to ensure that uh, there's inclusion and diversity, the values that we really want are part of this institute and part of how we're bringing the data together. I guess I'd like to ask you your thoughts on that, um, if that fits in or <laughs> if I'm just a little bit too much in my own world here. Um, Who wants to take that? Yep, go ahead. I think that's a hugely important question and one of the reasons why I think the particular cast of characters behind Rory is such a good sign is that I feel this isn't, you know, this isn't just a group who are interested in the data. This is a group that have perspectives on the questions of governance, the questions of accountability in science. But I think that strikes me as a really important question. If you want to build a data-driven uh, approach to research funding, um, the governance has to be baked in, I totally agree. Justin, did you want to comment? Yeah, thanks. I, I, I might try and answer that a little bit as well. Um, self-promoting previous work I've done, if I could. Uh, before the current project I talked about, I, I was funded by the European Research Council to look at, to do a study on the politics of evidence use. And one of the outputs of that was a call for consideration of the good governance of evidence. And so that's more focused narrowly on evidence to policy, but I think we're hearing a lot of, of important features of governance and, of, and it raises questions about what do we mean by good use of research. And that's a normative question, right? And so good governance frameworks have things like, and we've heard some of them today, you know, transparency. So our Indian colleague talked about how you know, the, the use of, of research has to be seen by everyone. And that's a transparency issue that we usually build into frameworks of good governance. But he also mentioned the independence and the autonomy of the body doing that. And so we can try and perhaps elucidate more, um, and I've done a little bit in, in my book, The Politics of Evidence, about features of the good governance of evidence for me are things like you know, rigor, scientific you know, method being uh, independence and the like, but also these are political decisions. So there are political governance factors like um, representation, accountability, transparency. And this is, that's, that's just one set of ideas that I've thought about before, but it's, it's a discussion to be had about what do we mean by good governance of research uh, that I think would be great to make explicit. 
We have a question if we can get a mic up to the back. Thank you. My name is JB Mahapatra. I work in, uh, I come from India. I work with uh, doc Dr. Bijar Raghavan, the opening speaker, as an advisor to his office. Uh, while, you know, to me, uh, Rory, uh, the philosophy and the imperatives, they are very compelling and its time has come. To me, as long as Rory aims at uh, telling the policymakers and uh, the funders, including uh, us, that you know, these are the sectors or these are the subsectors or these are the areas in which research funding should be deployed. That is no problem. But the challenge to me will be coming when Rory maybe extends itself and tries to do a review on review, meaning thereby if it ends up uh, chatting out scorecard for the researchers, then the issue of giving an opportunity of the, to the researchers for them to come to you. So that will be a little more bureaucratic than is anticipated right now. Who would like to take that? Question of school card and bureaucracy. Stian, do you want to? Mm -hmm. Go for it. Um, I think this is, this is a, a, a really important question. It's a question of, to some extent, quite bureaucratic detail, question of literally what goes on in specific decision-making meetings in, in, in government. And I think to some extent this comes back, this is the kind of, um, there is a question here about who is best placed to, 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 to push this stuff forward, who is best placed to understand it. In some, to some extent, it's a sort of public administration issue, so scholars of public administration. To some extent, this is the kind of issue that think tanks like the Institute for Government um, in London and no doubt others elsewhere in the world could, could approach, something about just literally how do you build the tools that are needed to do the staff work in particular, in particular meetings. And I think a really interesting question for Rory and anyone else looking at this is to what extent is this an academic question, to what extent is this a question for, for practitioners, and if so, how do you get that done? I mean, Quick comment from Richard Jones. Yeah, I, I mean, just want to. I, I mean, I think that the, the question of how these ideas uh, emerge into the you know wider research communities is a very important one. It's a question of research cultures, how research cultures are spread, both in institutions, universities, research institutes, but also through disciplinary cultures. Disciplinary cultures themselves are transnational and very um, uh, and very stubborn in their way about you know how a disciplinary culture judges what research is good research is you know pretty central to this it's quite difficult to, for, for a policymaker to get a handle on because essentially it's an emergent property of the interaction of lots of researchers across the world so I think that I engagement with research communities and I put that in plural deliberately I think it's going to be very important Thank you. Anybody else wish to comment on that? I, I mean, I'm not sure if I completely understood the the, um, the question about scorecards, but it just triggered a thought in my mind. Uh, there was a really good comment, um, a question from uh, the professor uh, on the side of the room on the previous session about the need for uh, not kind of being uh, homogenous and not having a one-size-fits-all model, and, and if I you know, correctly interpreted your comments, about um, the need for context specificity. And, and one of the things we're finding in our study uh, about African health research is you know, the idea of a single metric or a single scorecard really pushes people in, in a bad direction. They really resist that and push back. In one, one part, they don't want to be ranked against others, but also it too narrowly focuses what they do, as opposed to, I think, what we're hearing are you know, this need to look holistically or, or this need to look at sets of principles that can guide systems in the right direction. You know, what principles should we follow to improve our system of research generation, research use, and whatever it might be. Uh, and so rather than just coming up with a set of metrics, that's some other, another comment earlier said, you know, when, once you have metrics, they get gamed. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's about shifting that perception from we need one way to rank to we need principles that can guide our systems in their various diverse forms, but still with some clear idea of what makes it better. Thank you very much. A uh, question from the mic. Uh, I'm Stephen Curry, Imperial College, and Dora. Uh, I was very struck by Stephen's comment or plea <laughs> to Rory to get involved in an iterative discussion about you know, how best to go about decision making because I think it's clear that you know, we're all here gathered together today to look at you know, how best to make decisions about resource allocation and to run the research ecosystem for the benefit of, of everyone. But I think we have to acknowledge 
uh, that there isn't a, a solution out there that we're going to find. There isn't some platonic ideal uh, about you know, how we run research for the benefit of humankind. And so what more, or what do we, does the panel want to see Rory doing in order to communicate the fact that, yes, we can, we can probably make progress, but you know, there aren't answers, we might fail along the way, and given you know, Richard's comment about the disconnect between the perception of scientific advance and increasing political disenchantment, we live in a time when politics seems to operate by promising the world to everyone, 40 new hospitals, if you believe the news yesterday, for example. So what can we do to, because that's got to be a very important public debate, to you know, give sense to people of you know, what to, you know, set, how to set their expectations in reality? Very important question. Who would like to take that first? I mean, I could, yeah, France, I could start yeah. by, um, I think it's, it's a really important question. I think, I mean, one thing that Rory can do is make a bit explicit the way decisions are currently being made and who's involved in those decision-making processes as well, while kind of probing other ways, alternative ways, and, and drawing attention to who is excluded and why, bearing in mind that a lot of these systems that we're working with are imperfect and evolving all the time. So I think that sort of attention to where we are now and why we are constrained in the way we are provides like a useful basis to then interpret um, findings that emerge. So do the issues understand the baseline? <laughs> Anybody else? Richard? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess uh, absolutely. You know, this is an emergent system, and it, uh, you know, it, it exists in you know in a wider political environment. So I think. You know, we all what we all need to understand and need to communicate is that you know politics with a small p as well as politics with a big big p is intrinsically bound up for this. There's, you know, there are many competing interests going on here, and we're in the business of balancing many of the, those many competing interests in the usual messy and difficult way. And that, you know, that that's not something that has a simple and closed answer. Thank you very much. So we've got seven minutes left for questions before your coffee starts. We've got one at the mic. If anybody else would like to come down, please do. Go ahead. Hi, Vivian Zen at the William T. Grant Foundation. Um, it's, I came to this meeting trying to figure out what fit under the umbrella of research on research. So um, let me reflect back what I think I'm hearing and then ask my question. I'm hearing a lot about research on the production of research, research on the governance and decision making around the production of research. Um, I, I'm not yet hearing a lot about research on how that research is used or the broader impact of that research beyond the uh, scientific community. And so I'm just wondering if maybe I'm mishearing, I'm just not hearing it, or is, is there going to be um, a large portion of this work that's more about how research is used um, in broader policy and practice, so not science policy, but say in social policy, environmental policy, health policy and practice, um, and uh, into studying those kinds of problems. Because I could imagine we do quite a good job, actually, and I think it's very important work, to improve the production and governance decision-making issues around the production of research. But wait, we may do that in a way in which it doesn't actually generate more <coughs> useful and used research in policy and practice. And so it could happen, but it's not guaranteed. So I guess I'm trying to figure out what fits under this umbrella and where is the um, center of gravity in terms of the emphasis. Who would like to take that first? I, I could start by speaking to that. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. So the, the Rethinking Research Collaborative is made up not just of academics, but practitioners, research brokers, funders, policy makers, all working in this space. And I think crucial to any agenda setting work is looking at who, who is participating in, in agenda setting and how, what proportion are already working in this practice space or policy space as well. Um, the models of research that we look at are very much rooted in practice, whether through community-based organisations working with local universities or policy makers working in networks or um, regional networks of practitioners looking at the types of agendas that are important in those regions as well. So I think you can't think of, of global challenge research without starting at the point of research use and evidence needs and then 
looking backwards at what that means for both implementation of research and the governance evaluation and agenda setting and I think including non-academics within evaluation peer review panels as well as strategic boards is absolutely essential so I see all of these components as part of, of the same system I think. Thanks very much. Did we have uh, Richard? Did you want to make a quick comment, and then we've got one more yeah, question? I, I mean, I, I hope it, uh, my talk I, I concentrated on some very macro level outputs of science, as it were. You know, talking about productivity levels and uh, you know life expectancies. And of course, I understand. There's well, I don't understand all of it, but there's a giant gap in there. You know, what I think James and I tried to do in the biomedical bubble was to talk about you know the complete picture between the choices that we make about what research to support innovation systems, venture capital, how the pharmaceutical industry works, how the health, you know, how our healthcare sector works. You know, in every case, there's enormously complicated and rich discussion to be had about how you convert uh, research into impact, and I'm utterly fascinated by that. Very quick. Can I quickly, sorry, just I think oh. it's a really important question, and there are two, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, sorry, th there, were t there were two things that I've seen that I think are really interesting in that area. Um, in terms of digital tracking of the impact of research in the public debate, um, full fact, the UK organisation seems to develop some really interesting algorithmic things that allow them to track research findings through the media and see how they spread. And I'd be fascinated to hear whether we've got more examples of that um, for, for tracking the impact of, say, social sciences and humanities research. In terms of innovation and business, that kind of commercialisation side of things, um, the work that Juan Mateus Garcia has been leading at Nesta, equally the work of someone like Tom Forth at the Data City in Leeds. They seem to have built really interesting data sets that combine a lot of the science metric data with business microdata, with media data, which if we're thinking about the commercial impact of innovation to me seems really exciting. So those, those guys seem to be doing interesting stuff. Excellent. Uh, we've got one more question, if that's all right, yep. to come up, and then we will finish on time for the coffee, which I'm sure people are keen on. Go ahead. Um, hello, Jack Stilgo from University College London. Um, it was just a question really about the framing of the day. So a lot of us here are academics, and academics will never argue against more research. Um, but if we, if we frame the problem as one of a deficit of, of, of knowledge, I wonder whether that gets at what's really at issue here. Because it seems to me from Richard's presentation that we know quite a lot about what works and for whom in science funding, and the trouble is that the people who make the decisions don't really care very much. Um, so there's, there's a challenge if we just think that the problem is one of generating more evidence. Stian phrased this in terms of new tools, and I wonder, to the question, is there a difference between tools that might be useful for particular purposes and just the sorts of evidence that academics might conventionally throw into this debate? Excellent question to finish this session on. Who's going to volunteer to tackle that one first? <laughs> I'll go to Richard, seeing as you were mentioned first. Um, well, I, I, I mean, I think perhaps what um, what you're implying is that you, you know we, we, we you know we have a slightly technocratic framing that we have uh, you know we imagine a uh, masterly individual in Bayes who's of course Stian was one and successors in the audience and uh, who will be uh, integrating this vast quantity of information and producing some such, such, such marvelous output and I think you know as I, I've said just to repeat myself you know it's clear this is an emergent system that's enormously highly contested and if we take the question actually the very first question that we were posed which I still think is you know the the, the uh, question who does you know if you have a challenge who decides the question you know there are many different ways of answering that because we can frame that in terms of representative democracy that it's a minister who makes that decision ably advised by uh, people like Stuart we could have a kind of technocratic answer that you know it's a research council, a bunch of uh, of uh, eminent scientists, maybe even a token social scientist thrown in to that, that, that kind of sit around and make a decision around a table. We could take a kind of Hayekian view that you know the whole thing needs to be left to the market, and the only way of integrating the the the, the, um, the, the, the information that we have is through some kind of market mechanism. Or we could talk about so the, the kind of hybrid things that we're talking about, you know, better, more, more public engagement, more in, in, involvement of, uh, of other forms of collecting social intelligence. Uh, so um, there are many ways that, you know, I, I just argue for 
uh, for, for accepting the messiness and complexity and uh, emergence of the system and trying to do our best to throw a little bit of light in that uh, very complicated uh, landscape. Thanks very much. That has taken us right the way through till quarter past. All our panel are coming for coffee. So I'd like to thank them all. Thank you very much.